Hi, my name's Pete Knapp, an Air Quality PhD student at Imperial College London. This series of podcasts is kindly promoted by the Grantham Institute, the college's hub for climate change and environment. Subscribe to receive future episodes and contact the Grantham Institute on Twitter with at Grantham underscore IC and me with at Pete K underscore AQ. This is Tipping Points, a podcast featuring interviews with people who have become environmental activists. What made them change? What are they doing now? And what do they hope to see in the future as we face possible breakdown of civilization and life on Earth? This first series focuses on scientists in the UK. With me in this episode is Dr. Alex Penson from London. Welcome. Hi, Pete. Yeah, thanks for having me. I wonder if you could give me your life story in uh, in three minutes. So I um, really enjoyed science subjects at school, trained in physics. My first experience of activism was the Iraq War March. A couple of million people came out, and then um, you know nothing happened. That I think was a bit of a turn off for quite a long time 2008 or something was when I first got a sense of the climate and ecological situation um how how big it was I guess like the scale of it and I particularly remember back then reading this book called sustainable energy without hot air which um has lots and lots of um approximate calculations of how you could power a society using renewables only and it's hard, like you can do it, but using energy the way that we currently do is really hard. It was that and a number of other things showed me that the way that the subject is talked about in the news is is entirely wrong. It's not just about, oh, we're, we're not doing quite enough, or oh, we should be doing a bit more of this. It's like, no, 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 this is going to involve sweeping changes, like we absolutely cannot carry on the way that we are doing. Because these are energy calculations, right? There's nothing nothing that you can argue with, right? Uh, so that had a big impact on me. Yeah, I really went down a bit of a sort of obsessive rabbit hole. How old were you at the time uh, in 2008? Early 20s. Since then, I've felt like I was in the know. I didn't know what I could do. I didn't have any, couldn't think of any way that I could contribute to it definitely felt powerless but also i guess i convinced convinced myself things like flying being immoral because it wasn't going to be sustainable but then i took a job on a different continent from my family so it seems like inconsistent behavior so i switched at that point to studying cancer biology using new sequencing technologies why did you decide to take a job in that direction when you know, climate was so important to you. <laughs> it's a yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I think both felt important. I still can feel proud of the work that my colleagues and I do. There was quite a big change two or three years ago. Like um, for a long time, I was in quite a competitive environment. Like the work was never done. That became really that became really stressful, um, and I lost my job eventually and my current role is more supporting my colleagues who are experimental biologists so it's the same basic field but it's quite a different mindset but if I have a little time a little creative energy left at the end of the day it just feels like there's a million possible things to do just uh the scope for um me contributing just feels huge so that's a that's such a contrast to my earlier attitude you know i filled out a form on a xr website just saying that i was interested to help out and then shortly after got a cold call basically saying do i want to set up a kitchen as part of one of those two-week rebellions i hadn't done anything like that before didn't really know much about the task i I don't know. It seemed it seemed odd, but it seemed curious. So uh, that was my introduction to XR, 
and it was exciting. Like I recruited tons of people into some sort of telegram chat and um, tried to get hold of some kitchen equipment. It was again a roller coaster. <laughs> like did manage to get the equipment, then it got confiscated. Then on the day, um, a lot of people showed up, and we really did manage to feed lots and lots of um, folks. Now you've been involved in a lot in money rebellion. Can you tell us a bit about that? The financial system is a cause of this whole thing. Many features of international finance, you know, things that we take for granted, like, you know, joint stock companies and consolidated bonds and things like that. These were really set up to enable colonization, basically. You know, they this was in the early 1700s before the steam engine, right? It was set up in order to extract wealth and i mean that for folks in the west that has generated a lot of wealth but now it feels a bit like the sorcerer's apprentice right we can't turn it off the idea of money rebellion is to make people think differently about growth like growth imperative and the different institutions that are benefiting from fossil fuel production central banks for example the um, bank of england you know, has the power to regulate banks and to impose um, reserve requirements on risky behaviour. Part of their job is to try and mitigate climate and ecological risks. They should, in principle, impose reserve requirements on banks that are engaging in behaviors that lead to climate risks such as financing you know underwriting fossil fuel companies they don't do this um they absolutely don't do that um and so i feel like the bank of england is an excellent target because they are you know in principle a public institution um they work for us it's interesting so the the another the bank of international settlements refers to itself as a bank for central banks They've referred to climate risks as unhedgeable without system-wide transformation, which just feels to me, I don't know, that's horrifying. I feel like it's phrases like that that really sort of cut through to the um, the point I made earlier about you know this this being just touching on every aspect and re- requiring such a huge shift. Most of these companies are stuck in a situation where they are debt financed that is then um feeling like there is something sort of fundamentally wrong not just one thing like there are many things that are fundamentally wrong with society yeah the bank of england right says on its website just it will send you a little document that says like oh yes our our policies are aligned with a a um temperature rise of 3.5 degrees Right. And then you go over to the scientific literature and it's like, oh, 3.5 degrees will bring like a, a high probability of like a cascade of like uh, tipping points, which will, um, you know, um, put civilization at risk. And you're like, wait, high, it's, it's a high probability. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says that. Three and a half degrees, and a half on, degrees the website. on the website. Yeah, yeah. What? And you're like, wait a sec. The Bank of England, they make they make they, they make they make the money, don't they? Don't they make the money? It's like, yeah, yeah, they do. They're they're pretty they're pretty central to this whole enterprise, aren't they? It's like, oh mate. Jeez, I didn't know that. I didn't know they were actually advertising how much of a misunderstanding they have of what they're doing. <laughs> so I did this was over the Christmas holidays. I did a, a bit of a sort of unscientific research about the single fact that most got to that point of like something is very wrong i was trying to write a letter to someone maybe it was my mp or something like that so i wanted to just in a single sort of short sentence capture the idea that something is very wrong that we need a change in kind you know not just like a little bit more of this a little bit more of that no we need to stop we need to totally rethink and yeah, based on um, just a few little uh, few discussions with, uh, you know, not not entirely sympathetic family members, people that are, you know, quite prepared to listen, but not not just a not a total pushover. 
the stat about the uh, Bank of England that that one hit home because I think everyone has heard in the media usually it's um just all oh, you know one point is it one point five is it two degrees Paris Agreement says stay bet- below two degrees I think people have pretty much absorbed that um quite clearly three point five is not that at all I think you know I think it's it's quite clear that three point five is really very different to um to two degrees even though they sound like small numbers i think um i think people have gathered that or that at least people in my unscientific survey had were surprised and, and by and you by the sounds of it were surprised by like wait a second i didn't realize that that's very wrong and i'm like aha i'll send you um i'll send you the uh letter from rishi sunak as well where he says um that the uh he changes the bank of england's mandate their um, primary objective now explicitly includes mitigating climate and ecological risks. What do you mean? Well, so the Bank of England, for all of its history, has been set up to to create a stable economy, basically. That's the point. I mean, that's what a central bank is all about. Managing the economy such that it is stable. That's what it's there for. If ever they were called out, on the fact that they had this document that said that their um, portfolio was aligned with 3.5 degrees, their response to that was, well, you know, we're sorry, we we, we recognise this as a problem, but our mandate, you know, our sort of legal box that we're in is to look after the stability of the economy. That's, um, that's what we do. You know, we, we can't just um, reach out, wade out into... Um, dealing with um, climate and ecological issues, you know, we're a bank. But now, um, as of, you know, just a month or two ago, their mandate explicitly includes um, mitigating climate and ecological risks. And the Bank of International Settlements referred to climate risks as uninsurable, basically. Oh, mitigating climate risks. Oh, yeah, those are uninsurable those are unmitigatable risks <laughs> like oops and i think you know that right because like if your city is underwater like you can't insure that away like if one city is underwater then other cities can sort of rally round and you know try and i don't know what rebuild it or something like if there's a localized disaster then other this has happened throughout history right you know if one village gets um burnt down or something then the neighboring villages will come to some arrangement to rebuild the village you know it may not be a fair arrangement but you know there'll be some sort of some sort of uh structure some sort of agreement in place to try and absorb risks like that that's something that leads to globalization that leads to anyway yeah obviously if this is something that then affects the whole then it's not insurable like in the same way it's unhedgeable in the in the in the uh, jargon for for this topic especially when everything is so connected and you don't want to overwhelm your audience by going through the the real detail of everything i wonder if you've found that you've you've tried different approaches and sometimes they've worked well with some people and sometimes they've not worked quite so well as a scientist, my like if I can just come out with the latest um um horrifying fact, I increasingly try not to do that. I am concerned that the horrifying facts do have the effect of scaring people like they work, but scaring people most of the time is not the right approach, like a lot of people most people in society by polling like recognize that there is a climate emergency and that something should be done about it scaring people more tends to make people um you know look after their own to make people less inclined towards more complex solutions that maybe take negotiating the more you use that kind of emergency framing uh, people will respond to like top-down solutions which i guess means sort of authoritarianism right and I think that is maybe true in the aftermath of crises, right? Like if you make people, put people in the mindset of a crisis, like a flood has come through. In situations like that, it's usually uh, external companies, big, big organizations that are able to 
recover in in situations with local shocks right so even if people respond with more community in the immediate aftermath of a crisis often the longer term effect is big organizations taking more control like i, I anyway that's it i guess uh, local shocks and natural disasters generally don't lead to constructive social change the the inspiring message there is that the the thing that historically has led to social change is um you know a minority of committed individuals people would say that after the second world war lots of things had changed for the benefit of, of society and when a when a crisis like that happens that's an opportunity for for, for system change and and people are calling for that after covid to say you know grow back better build back better something and, um we can see some evidence of this, but as you're saying, when you have these global companies who who are all putting pressure on keeping things as they are, whereas after the Second World War, that may not have been such a, a big issue, and so l- bigger changes could have happened. What do you think about that framing? After the Second World War was an unusual time when um, inequality went down, right? before the Second World War in Europe, at least, Europe and America, inequality had been really high. Whereas in the 50s, it was then lower. And now it's been, or since the the 50s, 60s, it's been going up and up. It feels at a level that cannot continue, right? So this is how I see this as all part of um, the same kind of issue. For example, yeah, during COVID, like even though most of the economy was actually shut down, like the stock market carried on, going up and up a lot of these feel like examples where the uh conventional like international finance has become increasingly divorced from reality when people are are joining money rebellion how empowered do they feel in being able to make change because presumably people can change their bank right does that send enough of a message that's a great question well i mean Money Rebellion has lots of uh, tactics. There are some end up with news stories. They've had amazingly positive coverage. For example, the window smashing action in the Telegraph, for example, the Sun, um, the Daily Mail. On the other hand, there's a whole range of different protests. There's something for everyone, right? We are doing an income tax protest and council tax strikes, for example. I think these are exciting. Historically, tax strikes have been very, very effective. Uh, The suffragettes used it, but also, you know, going way, way, way back. The Magna Carta, right, was originally a tax strike. Then um, stickering, for example. You can just um, order some stickers and then go and stick them on your local ATM. So yeah, that's me. I'm a scientist. I'm um, recommending our listeners to go out and vandalize your local ATM. What makes the difference for me is that it's part part of like a coordinated and joyful, frankly, social movement. There are clear achievable goals of um, getting banks to cut ties with fossil fuel companies. Student divestment movement, that's been a campaign over 10 or more years to get universities to take their endowments out of fossil fuels. So I think that those have been huge symbolic victories for campaigners. But I think the understanding is that the financial implications are modest. Whereas the short term financing that fossil fuel companies get from banks like Barclays and HSBC is is more important to them. And so the idea is that we can humiliate um, retail banks into cutting their ties and this will have a a really valuable effect so that's that's you with the sticker sticking it to the atm and it's just a simple act of just saying i'm not okay with this do you think that sends enough of a message to the banks though it's small in its own i think that's it so um, a lot of the things that you would do with xr are seem really mundane on their own but they add up to a compelling whole right You can imagine one sticker on one ATM, like the banks are just, I mean, they're not even going to know, they're going to roll their eyes. But if there's a really sort of sustained months long campaign 
of people all around the country, in fact, all around the world, just saying, I'm not okay with this. You know, Barclays and HSBC pouring billions into fossil fuels um, is killing all of us. We're not okay with this. It'd be really interesting to hear more about your when you were at the demonstration at the Bank of England, because... I think the headline was uh, four arrested after Extinction Rebellion attacked the Bank of England with crude oil or something like that. What was that like? Yeah, that was the first time for ages that I've been part of a, a protest like that. I thought the April Fools were really great. That didn't get picked up in the media too much. So the 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 punch character, right? Like he typically says um, in um, Punch and Judy shows, Punch says um, that's the way to do it. But this punch, of course, said that's not the way to do it. And um, they were like prancing around in um, in these outfits. You know, they've got like hats with little bells on it and just talking about, you know, the Bank of England and all their bailouts that like during um, coronavirus, uh, people in this um, country have been out of work, have been going hungry. And um, the Bank of England's bailing out Rolls Royce, Rolls Royce. <laughs> and Punch says, that's not the way to do it. Oh, brilliant. I think um, making that kind of stuff funny is uh, quite a, it's quite an achievement. So there was the, the, the comedy element of that one at the Bank of England, but also there were these windows. So um, the, the Bank of England um, doesn't have any windows for security purposes, apparently. So um, we, we placed these windows in the, um, in some little alcoves so the uh, the idea is that it's you know you're seeing what's really going on inside and of course it wasn't just in in england right it happened around the world oh man the one in france was um was lovely yeah because they um they managed to they sent some climbers that actually managed to get up onto a little balcony and drop down this huge banner and they had um smoke flares and they were just dropping like just scattering money it just brings a tear to the eye um i think i hadn't realized that it would be in multiple countries when i went to the action so i think that again makes it feel really really compelling how important do you think the role of comedy is then in demonstrations i think it's important um i think it's really important to make the to keep the mood light there can be just creativity or just something a little bit clever or sly. I think XR's generally been really good at that. Have you heard of the BBC iPlayer series uh, called Can't Get You Out of My Head? Uh, by Adam Curtis. Yeah, yeah, I watched that. I found it frustrating at first like he just darts between he darts between what is it jang ching from china and then michael x and then um and he's trying to make these very obscure connections between these different people i really enjoyed the first adam curtis that i watched it is called century of the self talks about the how pervasive psychoanalytical techniques became starting from the second world wars he makes a compelling case about the extent to which businesses and advertisers used in advertising he particularly talks about the focus group um focus groups of course you get some people together you get how, learn how they feel about the the product you try and ask them sort of um just random questions, get them to do role playing and stuff about the object instead of just you present them with the object. Oh, that that was previously how advertising had gone. You give someone a new object like, oh, we have this, um, you know, washing up detergent. What do you think about it? And the person would say, well, detergent A is slightly better than detergent B. That was how advertising had gone. After the war, it was more like, well, what does what does detergent mean to you? Like, <laughs> etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then later episodes of that series are about um, political focus groups, which really came became a big thing in like the eighties, and how um, candidates instead of saying like I am the best candidate, here are all my policies. I have policy A, policy B, policy C. Um, instead, it was like, but how do you feel about the candidate? Like, oh, does he seem like on your team? Does he seem like a guy that you'd like to have a beer with, etc.? 
and that's how politics has become increasingly focus group etc critique critique of one society i wonder if if he might be persuaded to do something of a similar style that actually does hit home with with the breadth and the complexity and so on of the climate crisis could that style be you know effective in with this message or it certainly could. Oh, I really think it could. Um, I assume that there are people that have been, um, people have tried to persuade him. I don't know. Maybe, maybe at some point he'll go on a bit of a journey. Like, um, I think like David Attenborough, I guess, is another sort of public figure who you might have thought would be more on board with radical change over the last whatever 10 years and was always very resistant to like no no i think um i think things are mostly fine it's like what are you talking about <laughs> and i feel like he has like he has gone on a real journey over the last couple of years right um so yeah maybe one day maybe when um adam curtis is 96 he'll go on a similar journey i don't know blue planet 2 had a whole episode about plastic and a, had an albatross like puking up a bunch of plastic bags and stuff. And um, it was horrible. And um, that really had an enormous effect on the way that supermarkets um, supermarkets cut back on. Like there was a huge sort of public uproar about um, single use plastic. Right. And I mean, you can argue about how constructive that is. But I think when Attenborough and the whatever BBC nature team put out compelling content like it really hits home i mean you know millions of people watch it and um it can really i can know it really can have a strong effect most recent episodes just or most recent programs just in the last whatever year or two uh there was extinction the facts um that's brutal it's a totally different tone and it does really talk about um large-scale solutions i think even that one frustrated me because in the later scenes they just have you know some pictures of politicians in suits at a conference dealing with um the ozone layer i mean the the hole in the ozone layer and it, they say like oh yes well um but you know um we we've got some crises now but look at these um politicians that went to this conference and decided not to use um cfcs or whatever <laughs> and that's again just so frustrating like that's the message that you're going to leave people with seriously like you've had 40 minutes of tv about like how um like all marine life is just in an absolute downward trajectory just um you know 90 percent by weight is humans and livestock yeah <laughs> like after like after going into so much detail about that your solution is like Oh yeah, well, pretty much, um, pretty much, politicians are just gonna fix it. It's like, what are you like? What are you saying? That's so annoying. <laughs> yeah. So one, even more recent than re extinction, the fact that did cover, um, like advocacy. Even the series is a perfect planet. Um, uh, it was out beginning of this year. The the last episode is called Humans. Um, and it had some pictures of student student activists like waving waving signs, but it doesn't even that like doesn't put the viewer it doesn't give the viewer a role right it leaves it leaves the impression that the viewer is not a participant right it's just sort of presenting the situation it's like oh yes we have the situation and like oh it could go either way you know like we could have the the better future or we could have the the bad future and it's like so it's presenting the situation it's like oh well it's a really um it's a really dramatic scenario it's like you're at the end of a, a sports game or something and um you know well it could go either way it's going to come down to the wire kind of thing and oh yes there are these students there are these students that are on the field you know but it's like it's not like you, the viewer, are on the field. You can do something, you know. Like, and wouldn't that be like a more um, positive, hopeful message, right? To leave the viewer feeling like they are part of something bigger than themselves, right? Right, rather than just like this is just more content you can stream to your TV, and you know, well, it could go either way. 
and then you just flip over to the next channel it's like well here's a you know oh it's like master chef like oh is it is johnny gonna win or is andy gonna win it's like <laughs> it could go either way it's like oh but so close it's close right they have actual advocates on the on the on the nature program saying like nature is important to me i'm going and waving a sign a fascinating chat alex thank you very much for that oh yeah thanks music from climate by eric ian walker commissioned by the climate music project we communicate the sense of urgency of the climate and ecological crises through the emotional power of music more to be found at eric ian walker.bandcamp.com and climatemusic.org